Oh, Merry Christmas. It is still Christmas. You know, it's Christmas until Epiphany. What a beautiful day today to worship God and to celebrate, continuing to celebrate the birth of God's Son. I'm David Hall. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Church. It's my pleasure to welcome you. I see that you did not get the word that I'm preaching today. And Fred, it's too late. You cannot leave. <laughs> I'm watching you all, okay? It is such a joy to get to do that today. You know, may remember, by the way, we're giving Nathan, our senior pastor, by the way, he's an awesome senior pastor. Would you agree with that? <laughs> Hopefully that'll offset some things I say a little later. Um, but if we're giving him a little bit of time off, and he's deserved that. Last year at this time, we were having in-person worship only. I'm, I'm sorry, online worship only, no in-person and so we would get together, the musicians and singers would get together on Saturday and record the music. Whoever was preaching would record that on Saturday. And then on Sunday, the only people here really were the people doing announcements, reading scripture or praying, and they were in person. I want you to see a picture of me last year on that Sunday. Yeah, I've expected to see this posted somewhere that says, David Hall preaches to a packed sanctuary. <laughs> It is so good today to have you all here worshiping with us, and I know people worshiping with us online. On behalf of the staff, I want to thank you for your generosity and giving to us, for affirming us, and for encouraging us. It is a real pleasure as a staff to serve alongside you all. If you're sitting closest to the aisle on your row, I would appreciate it if you'd reach up and take out that blue attendance pad, write in your name and contact information, and then pass it along your row and back. If you're worshiping at home, if you would, open the Christ Church app and uh, there's a place there to register attendance. And it doesn't matter what time of day or which day of the week you're worshiping with us, please do let us know that you are with us. We have had such a wonderful Advent season. We've had very powerful worship services. We've had music that really drew us to the heart of God. Next Sunday, January the 2nd, we're going to do like we're doing today. It'll be one service at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary uh, I will not be preaching, so those of you at home, feel free to come. Yeah, again, it'll be a blended service and a beautiful service at 10 o'clock. And then on January the 9th, we're back to our three worship services, and uh, we're starting a new sermon series. It's called Inspired to New Heights. Here's a video preview of that. These majestic peaks are inspiring, aren't they? Here in our little corner of the U.S., we have mountains too. And what they lack in elevation, <laughs> they make up for in beauty and history. No matter their size or shape, we tend to look at mountains with a sense of awe and wonder. And there's something about hiking or climbing a mountain that inspires us. Maybe that's why mountains play a major role in the Bible. As we go through life, People also inspire us to go beyond what we thought we could be or do. During January, we're going to explore some of those sources of inspiration. Some of those are in the Bible, and we'll take a look at those. You will also hear people from our congregation tell about those who inspired them to persevere when they were struggling or to try to accomplish something they didn't think they could do. Hopefully, this series will remind you of all the people who have inspired you on your journey. Maybe it will even inspire you to be faithful in how you live your life. You never know when you are an inspiration to others. The series is called Inspired to New Heights. It begins January 9th. Tell somebody else about it and join us as we worship together at Christ Church. Merry Christmas. If you will stand to your feet, pray that you have felt the nearness of God this season. Let's sing and rejoice because our God loves us. Put our hands together.
Oh. 
Emmanuel, God is with us. Christ is born. Merry Christmas. My name is Debbie Stokes. It's my joy to serve as one of your pastors here, and I'm happy to be reading to you the gospel from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I will call my son. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Love incarnate, love divine, star and angel gave the sign. Bow to babe on bended knee, the Savior of humanity. Unto us a child is born, he shall reign
Hello, welcome to Children's Moment. So glad that you have joined us today. So kids, gather around and let's just chat for a minute. Well, Merry Christmas. Yes, I know Christmas was yesterday, but we can still choose to celebrate today. And that reminds me, have you ever played one of these games? The mazes where you start here and you gotta find your way down here and all kinds of choices. And with this kind of a game, you can make a mistake and just erase it or start over until you find your way. Well, sometimes that's the way it is each day for us, isn't it? We have choices to make. Sometimes we don't really want to make a choice. We want somebody to do that for us. And then sometimes we don't know what to choose. But the good news is that God is always there to help us make the good choices. So this week, as you're going about your days and have those choices to make, ask God to help you make the wisest choices possible because that's what's important. Remember, God's always with us. He's always willing to help us. Thank you for joining me today. I'll see you next time. Our children's minister, Mary Beth, always gives wonderful mission moments and, and sermons. And Mary Beth is with us today. Can we just, yes. It is our time to give for our offering. And so uh, you may give as you exit or as you enter this morning. You may give through our church app or online. You may give by dropping it off at the church office or mailing it in. But also keep in mind that if you're planning to put it on your 2021 taxes, it needs to be postmarked by December 31st. So thank you for the generosity you are as a church. As this church is celebrated, even in the midst of COVID, many opportunities for mission and ministry here and around the world. So we come to the conclusion of this year celebrating God's work through you in your generosity and giving. Let us bow together in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we thank you as we come and celebrate that you are with us. You have given us your beloved Son in Jesus Christ to be our Savior. Christ is born so that we can be born again, afresh and anew, to make those right choices and decisions as you lead and guide us to, to share your light with the world. So may the gifts you have placed into our hearts and lives of your peace your joy, your hope, and your love be gifts that overflow from who we are into the world that is so hungry to know how much you love them. We pray this day that you will be with those who need you in special and particular ways, who are going through difficult times, who need your comfort and your peace who need your peace that passes all understanding, that you are with them and you're going to take care of them. We pray for those who are going through a season of sickness, that you may be the great physician working alongside our wonderful earthly doctors and nurses and medicines and therapists and machines and researchers in labs far away, that you're working through all to bring your healing power into their lives. We pray, we continue to pray for those in Kentucky and Missouri and Arkansas who have experienced the tornadoes, that you may give your healing into that area as well. We thank you for the gift of your precious word. We pray for Pastor David today as he brings the message. And we thank you for the gift of prayer. And we pray together that prayer just now. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
four years ago, on a Saturday just before Christmas, I got up early and headed to Middle Tennessee to do Christmas with my family there. Uh, our tradition is to meet for a lunch in a nice restaurant, to visit with one another, have a good lunch, and then we exchange Christmas gifts in the parking lot before we head home. This was a beautiful, clear winter day, and I had my red Toyota sleigh packed full of chocolate candy that Becky had made for everybody, all kinds of presents. I was really looking forward to the day. Just as I rolled along US 111 up on the plateau high above Cookville, my cell phone rang. The cell phone was lying on the console of the truck, and I looked down and I saw that it was their senior pastor, Nathan Malone, calling me, but I answered anyway. <laughs> Nathan, uh, Nathan began by saying, David, I am so sorry to do this to you, but I feel really bad today. You're going to need to preach tomorrow. Uh, he sounded terrible. He was coughing. He was hoarse. I could tell he really did feel bad. And then he went on to say, you know, tomorrow is the third Sunday in Advent, and so your sermon needs to be on joy, the gift of joy. And Nathan, you all know, he is a really nice guy. And and he said, David, I've got my sermon all prepared, and if you'd like, I'll just email that to you, and you can preach it. I didn't say it, but I thought, surely I can do better than that. <laughs> so I told him, thank you, I would get prepared, and I headed on my way. I, I did Christmas over in Middle Tennessee and headed home in the late afternoon. As I drove along, God began giving me things, illustrations and points to make. And, and by the time I got home, I really had the scriptures picked and I had a rough outline of my sermon in my mind. I went home, I sat down at my computer in the study and I went to work. And a few hours later, I had the sermon ready. God had given it to me. It was entitled, The Light of Joy. I went to bed early that night. And I woke up the next morning refreshed and ready to preach that sermon. Sometime between 7 and 7.30 a.m., Nathan called me. And he said, David, I feel so much better this morning. I'm going to be able to preach. Thank you so much for preparing. Nathan had gotten well. How inconsiderate of him. That sermon became the sermon never preached. Uh, it was the thing not done. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want us to focus on the thing in our lives not done. Now, I realize on the day after Christmas, it can be kind of scary to think about the thing not done. <laughs> you know, it's the, the, the card we never sent. It's the gift we didn't make or buy. Uh, the meal we went to prepare and didn't do that, but no, not really. I want us to think about the things not done as the things not yet done and the opportunity to complete those things and as we do that, to write the rest of the story. Matthew alone tells us about Herod's encounter with the Magi and how insanely jealous he was when he learned that a new king might have been born uh, in Israel. So it's Matthew alone who tells us about the story we heard read earlier, about Joseph being warned in a dream, taking the baby southwest into Egypt for his protection. One of the most beautiful things about the way the Gospels are written is the way God used the Holy Spirit to inspire the Gospel writers, four of them, in different ways, using the personalities, the knowledge, the context of each of those Gospel writers to tell the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Most likely, Mark was written with inside information from the Apostle Peter. He skips right over the birth and goes to the baptism and the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. John was written last. And John, is, he tells us about the birth, but he does it in a very abstract theological way. He uses words like, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. See, that's the Christmas story, but told in different language. Luke was a Gentile, and Luke really champions the marginalized, people who've been pushed aside in society. And so Luke, he, he's the one who tells us about this blue-collar couple up in Nazareth who are required to go to Bethlehem. He's the only one who tells us about a manger 
as the crib. He's the one who tells us that the angels came to shepherds, marginalized men out in a field. Luke's first audience was Gentile. He was Gentile. And so he helps us Gentiles to understand the story by explaining things that are Jewish. Matthew, on the other hand, was Jewish. And Matthew's first audience was Jewish. And one of Matthew's main purposes <clears throat> in writing was to convince his Jewish sisters and brothers that Jesus of Nazareth really was and is the promised Messiah. In order to do this, Matthew really emphasizes how things in the life of Christ fulfills prophecies in what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Now, knowing that helps us to better understand why Matthew chooses to tell us certain things. A wonderful example of this comes in verse 15 that we heard read just a few minutes ago when Matthew writes, And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now this is set up in the Old Testament book of Exodus when the writer referring to the children of Israel coming out of slavery in Egypt says, out of Egypt I call my son. The prophet Hosea, also in the Old Testament, picks up on that and in talking still about the children of Israel, says out of Egypt I call my son. Matthew sees a second and very powerful message in this and he uses these words, of God's son being called out of Egypt to refer to Jesus, the baby coming out of Egypt where he had been taken for protection. This must have been a really difficult time for Joseph. Think about it. Here he is, a carpenter from Nazareth, way out of place down in Egypt. How hard it would be for him to find work and ways to sustain his family. I'm guessing the gold that those magi brought came in handy. Uh, the frankincense and the myrrh were very expensive, and I'm guessing maybe they helped to sustain the family until Joseph could get them home. Joseph would have been nagged the whole time he was in Egypt, knowing, I need to get my family home. I need to get them back to our families. I need to get them to our home village of Nazareth. This became Joseph's thing not yet done, because the only the story only begins there. Because Joseph, Matthew tells us, takes his wife and his child and he leaves Egypt when it's safe and he comes back to Israel. He goes to Galilee and winds up in Nazareth. The rest of the story is the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ, and all those things we wouldn't have if Joseph hadn't chosen to do the thing not yet done. That's my challenge for us today to see the things not done, not so much as disappointments and failures, but as simply as the opportunity to write the rest of the story. The rest of the story, when things not done get done, is often the most beautiful part. I graduated from a tiny high school in Middle, in Middle Tennessee in rural Smith County. There were less than 200 in that high school. There were 42 in my graduating class. Now, hearing that, you would tend to think about a poor faculty, a lack of resources, unprepared students. Nothing could be further from the truth. Some of the teachers I had in that high school were the best. They were better than a lot of the professors I had in college. Our math teacher, and that was Algebra one, Algebra two, Geometry, Trigonometry, Precalculus, all of that was taught by Mr. Reynolds. Behind his back, we called him Doc Reynolds. He was awesome, and oftentimes, his students won the district math contest competing against much higher schools. Uh, science, biology, chemistry, and physics were all taught by Herman James. He was tough, but boy, did you ever learn science under him. Our English teacher was about six feet tall. Her name was Miss Patsy Poston, and you either loved Miss Poston or you hated her. <laughs> I chose to love her. Um, when she graded your papers, your themes, she graded on content, sentence structure, grammar, punctuation, spelling, I mean the works. And when you interpreted literature in her class, you better get beyond the surface words of the poem. You better get to the deeper meaning that the poet was driving toward. I graduated from high school and I headed to Tennessee Tech to major in civil engineering. 
My first term, I had three courses, calculus, chemistry, and English, that I am convinced were designed to get you out of engineering school. <laughs> I had three other classes that were a bit easier. Like most first-term freshmen, I was intimidated and frankly a little scared. By midterm, I had discovered something. I was as well prepared for college and engineering school as anybody there, including kids from huge schools. By the end of that term, I realized I had a huge thing not done. I had never thanked my high school teachers. Now, whoever does that anyhow, right? So I would go home oftentimes on weekends, and when I did, I would tend to, to go to a football game or a basketball game, and I used those games as opportunities to seek out those teachers. And I would sit with them, and I'd tell them how things were going in college, and I would thank them. And I would thank them for what they had done for us and for helping us to do well. Apparently, this does not happen often enough. Each of those teachers seemed really surprised, probably surprised that I was doing well in college, <laughs> but they also were so surprised that a student was coming back to thank them. A couple of them almost seemed embarrassed to have a former student come and praise them. I remember telling Ms. Poston, my English teacher, that it was a lot easier to get an A on a theme in college than it ever was for her. <laughs> she laughed and said, you just keep on getting those A's, David. Uh, as time passes, we look back on things like this and we remember the best parts, don't we? Uh, sure, if I think real hard about it, I can remember some really difficult exams in high school. I, I can remember long homework assignments. But the thing I remember the most are the smiles and the pride those teachers showed in having helped their students to succeed. What is your greatest thing not yet done? Remember, it is never too late to do it until it is too late. I still have a long list of things not yet done. Now, please don't misunderstand me. This is not your bucket list. You know, the bucket list are things you've always wanted to do, places you've always wanted to go, but just somehow haven't gotten around to it. This is not it. These are the things that are not done because it's going to take some courage or it's going to take some energy to go and tackle them. <clears throat> In 2011, we completed the Commons edition here at Christ Church. And we added, my goodness, a wonderful worship space, a kitchen, a youth center. We added offices. We modified our nurseries. We added tons of parking. And when we finished, we had facilities that are going to take care of us for years to come. But when we finished, we also had a huge debt. Um, it was $4.5 million. That's a lot of debt. Paying down that debt became Christ Church's thing not done. I want you to see what you have done on paying down that debt. Look at that. From $4.5 million in 2011 to $730,000 in 2021. <laughs> Through your generosity, our thing not done is almost done. In fact, if you keep giving, if we keep giving to the building fund the way we're giving now and paying on that, we will have that debt totally paid off. We will be debt free in 2023. Now here comes the rest of the story, okay? We had a futures team go to work here at Christ Church in August and they really rolled up their sleeves. They, they looked at demographics in our area and surrounding areas. They looked at the population. They looked at uh, population projections of growth. They looked at all kinds of things. And then they, uh, they did an analysis of the church's strengths and weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And they put together a five-year strategic plan of things that will help us, all of us, to grow deeper in our faith and will help us to reach out into our community to serve needs. This plan only requires a handful of additional staff. In fact, I think there's like three and a half positions uh, that are in this plan because the work and the leadership is going to come from our membership, not the staff. 
Our church council approved the plan in early December and it will be uh, rolled out very soon. Some of the things in that plan can be done right away, but some of them are gonna take quite a bit of time. When we make that last debt payment in 2023, it'll be the first time since Christ Church bought this property that we will not be in debt and have to make monthly debt payments. That should give us so much more in resources to do more in ministry, in missions, and in service. You'll be seeing that strategic plan very, very soon and getting to tackle those new things that will help us to write the rest of our story. Now, doing things not yet done individually and as a church can be challenging, can be intimidating, sometimes it can even be scary. The writer of Hebrews had something to say about this, about hanging in there, finishing our race, doing our things not yet done. Hear this from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I love the imagery in those two short verses. As we run our race in life, there are things that can weigh us down. There are things that can get us tangled up, that can cause us to stumble and fall and perhaps not finish our race. But the writer is telling us to put all that aside and to fix our gaze, not at the runner beside us, but to fix our gaze upon Jesus Christ who stands waiting for us at the goal line. It is the race marked out for us individually. Your race is not my race, but we're to run our own race. Others watch us run, and so they become part of our cloud of witnesses. Some of those witnesses have gone on before us. Some of them uh, stood for us as wonderful examples. And so if we listen really well, we can hear them cheering us on in our race. When we do our things not yet done, we need that kind of encouragement. Some of the things not yet done are difficult. There are apologies that we haven't made. They may be reconciliations that we haven't even attempted. They are ministries that we haven't yet started. And you can just fill in the blanks. We face them in our work, we face them in our families, we face them in our church. But the best part of the story comes when we do the things not yet done. So go and do them. Bow with me. Gracious God, in this season of Christmas, we give you thanks for your abiding presence, for the love you showed us in the gift of your Son. And as we kind of take stock of where we are and what we've done and what we have yet to do, we give you thanks that you remind us of things not yet done, things that may be a little tough to do, may be very difficult to do, but we know that you will be with us. And whatever we choose to do, whether it's paying down debt, taking on new ministries, whatever it is we choose to do, help us to do it in your love, in your power, and in your grace. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. This morning, would you stand? I want you to hear this invitation. If you are here and one of your things not yet done is accepting Christ, please come. I'm going to be standing here on the front row, and I would be so happy to chat with you about that. If it's uh, one of your things not yet done is haven't joined the church yet, but you've been thinking about it, come and let me know that. And for those of you at home, if your thing not done is either of these, give me a call or a text. My number's on the screen. It's 402-0621. I would love to chat with you about that.
benediction. And now may the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you and bless you. Amen. Thank you.